So this is my last lecture to you in this COVID semester of Bio 130. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you in class, in class, uh, and I'm really excited for what you're going to do in your future. So I just want to give you some sort of, we're going to do a little bit of a review to kind of help you wrap your brain around everything that you've learned. Um, uh, and then we'll talk about what what's next. What are the next steps? So what have we learned? A lot of stuff. And so I want to take a minute and just go through each week. Now, this is not comprehensive. This is not meant to be a final exam review. It is just meant to get you thinking about the things that, that would be on the final and things that you should be taking with you into the next classes that you're going to take. Um, <clears throat> and so to, for actual review for the final, I would pull up the learning outcomes for the whole semester. Uh, this is just going to kind of jog your memory on what we talked about. So week one, nature of science. You did the termite experiment. We talked about independent and dependent variables, how to, how to phrase a hypothesis. That's the why this is happening. And then the prediction is what's going to happen in my experiment. We talked about theories and how they're different from hypotheses correlation versus causation. Then we did statistics. If you remember, this was the chi-squared sampling distribution and the p-value is the probability of getting something that weird by chance alone. And your alpha value is where you set it to say, if it's weirder than this, we're going to reject our null hypothesis and say that, that something has happened. Week two was chemistry, all about atomic structure and bonding and ionic bonds, covalent bonds. We went through the macromolecules and the proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, what they're made out of. We looked at hydrocarbons and properties of water. Um, week three was cells and disease. We talked about the cell membrane. We talked about tonicity, hypertonic, hypertonic, isotonic, if that rings a bell. We talked about viruses, whether they were enveloped or non-enveloped, lysogenic versus lytic. We talked about bacteria and the different shapes and the different um, clustering of them and whether they're gram positive or gram negative. We talked about antibiotics, vaccines, you did the dead gerbil activity. <clears throat> In week four, it was all about metabolism. So we started with enzymes, active sites, specificity. We then did energy and how our bodies store energy in these coupled reactions with ATP. Um, and then we learned the process of say the respiration and of photosynthesis. You should have these drawings out, right? The final is open book, so you should be able to use these drawings. In cellular respiration, if we don't have oxygen, we do fermentation. In photosynthesis, if we don't have access to the air, we do photorespiration. And so we've got some workarounds in the CAM plants and C4 plants, which recently came up again in one of the later weeks. Uh, so that was metabolism. Week five was all about reproduction and genetics. So we went through meiosis. We did the Jack and Jill activity in lab. We talked about non-disjunction events and what that's going to do with our homologous chromosomes. Um, we talked about all of the genetics, right, using probabilities. So we had complete dominance, the normal autosomal dominant recessive um, patterns. We had co-dominance, like blood types. We had incomplete dominance, like where the mixing of the heterozygote, you have red and white and pink in the middle. We did sex-linked traits, like color blindness, male pattern baldness. And then we did linked traits, where it's on the same chromosome, right, and they get inherited together. So you'll want to go back through and look at all those uh, genetics. And then we moved on to mitosis and the cell cycle and cancer. So that's the cell cycle. We looked at DNA structure and replication. We looked at checkpoints in the cell cycle and how those missing checkpoints can lead to cancer. And then we did gene expression. So transcription, processing, translation, what the mutations do. This was the particular SMN1 mutation that we did for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, <clears throat> so you want to go back through and make sure you remember like that the messenger RNA looks just like the coding strand um, and we're reading them in triplets and getting rid of our introns and all of that. Uh, week seven was gene regulation and biotechnology. So that's when we went into all those cool techniques. You did Jack the Ripper in the lab. Uh, we looked at polymerase chain reaction, PCR, gel electrophoresis to separate by size. We looked at short tandem repeats, STRs the uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms that's where you dump all your dna in, put a restriction fragment in and then you get a dna fingerprint um, then you looked at all these different techniques so remember we have to be able to interpret those this was qpcr we have northern blots western blots molecular mass regulatory elements uh, you looked at gmos genetically modified organisms using plasmids to insert dna uh, you did a little bit on blast with jurassic park and looking at sequences and how they line up um, 
week eight, evolution. We started into evolution. We started with microevolution and the mechanisms using Hardy Weinberg. So I know like, oh, big gasp, Hardy Weinberg is hard. Uh, but it's the math, right? P squared, Q squared, 2PQ. And then you looked at the assumptions, which were basically the mechanisms of microevolution. So we had gene flow, which is immigration and migration, genetic drift, which is just random change, mutation, obviously, natural selection, where you're selecting for a certain um, characteristic, and then non-random mating, which is like sexual selection. You guys did the snails in lab. Um, Week nine, we started talking in more depth about natural selection and then some macroevolution in like speciation events. So this is just a picture of that, that movie you watched on the multidrug resistant tuberculosis and talking about natural selection, how you have to reach biotic potential, there have to be differences in fitness, this variation comes from mutation and there have to be limiting factors so that not everybody can survive. And then the macroevolution, we looked at the species concept. So biological, can they mate and produce viable fertile offspring? Morphological, do they look the same? Ecological, do they live in the same place and use the same resources? And phylogenetic, does their DNA look the same? Um, and week 10, we got into more phylogenetics, uh, looking at tree thinking, and we talked about human evolution. Uh, so we went through differences in humans and chimps and their chromosomes, simian shell versus a chin, brow ridges, muzzle shape and size, and then you need to be able to read a tree, right? Looking at nodes and branches, mapping characters on the tree, making monophyletic groups versus peri or polyphyletic groups, looking at synapomorphies versus the symplesium morphy, which is sort of the ancestral state, uh, homoplasy with convergent evolution, um, all those kinds of things. There's that great application activity that I gave you that was just a tree thinking assessment that you could go back and practice. Um, Week 11, we got into population growth. This is when all your fruit flies died. And we looked at their um, population. We did exponential growth and logistic growth and predator-prey relationships. But then we also did life history strategies. So you play that little game with the beetles, right? Where you put energy into growth, maintenance, reproduction. We have different strategies, different survivorship curves. Some produce or practice terminal investment if their environment is very stable. Whereas if you have a stochastic environment, you're gonna reproduce early, all of that kind of stuff. Um, week 12 was our ecological dynamics, so we looked at intra and interspecific uh, relationships of symbiosis, we looked at trophic structures and energy going up, we did that isotope stuff with the carbon and nitrogen isotopes to try to figure out which trophic level they're at and who's eating who, and then you looked at nutrient cycling, nitrogen and carbon cycles specifically, you did the Graham and Johnson problem. Um, week 13 you did at home over Thanksgiving, and this just looked at animal behavior. So we looked at proximate versus ultimate causation. So proximate being, you know, this is what's actually happening, the mechanism inside the, the body of the organism that's making it do what it does. And then ultimate is that, you know, it's some kind of evolutionary advantage. So there's an ultimate reason that they do mimicry or camouflage. Um, we looked at the difference between genetic influences versus environmental influences fixed action patterns that everybody sort of has that's genetic, but then we have these environmental influences that can be epigenetic. They can control when genes are turned on and off, and we can have like learned behaviors. Um, week 14 was our last week where we looked at climate and conservation. So we looked at all the different things that affect climate, your rain shadow effect, where you are on the globe latitude wise, where you are on the globe evolu evolution elevation wise wow hadley cells where you get kind of the moisture going up in the air and then dropping and then you get dry areas at 30 degrees above and below the equator and um and then we looked at biodiversity how do we define it richness evenness and then what are the threats to it like habitat destruction eutrophication um, pollution climate change um, that kind of thing and then we applied that to uh, functional plant types that was your lord of the rings cool activity that you did um, and then we talked about stewardship, right, with Easter Island and, and what's, a, what's the scenario, what's the best scenario, and what can science tell you and what can't it tell you and what's your moral obligation. It's, that's more of a question for you uh, to figure out rather than a scientific question. Um, so those are all the things that we learned in this class. Now, obviously, you're going to want to go back and look at the individual learning outcomes, but this is a good overview to just get you to realize how much you've learned in this class to help prepare you for future semesters. Okay, so what else have you learned? Hopefully you've learned how to think like a scientist. I really try to infuse scientific reasoning into this class, so we looked at a lot of 
data. We did a lot of analysis. We did a lot of independent dependent variables. We really tried to think like scientists think. Um, we also looked at how the gospel and biology go hand in hand, right? We talked a lot about that when we talked about evolution. We talked about that when we talked about animal behavior and just the beauty that, that our Heavenly Father has created for this earthly experience that we have. And hopefully you've also learned to be a good steward of the gifts that we've been given. So why should we learn? I'm just going to give my little spiel on education, right? So if you're thinking about dropping out of college, don't. And this is why. So learn for knowledge. Grades are not enough. In fact, they show that as you start to make learning your goal rather than an A your goal, you actually do better and it's easier. And this has been shown in the research. Um, one of my favorite scriptures, DNC 9336, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Um, and second Nephi, do we learn it as good if we hearken to the counsels of God? So I hope that you value education like I do, and that some of these things that you learn you may never use again, but you just want to know them, because this is really all that we get to take with us um, after we die. And so you should just want to learn because you want to know about God's creations. Uh, do it for your children. So this is a really cool study where they looked at, this is beta coefficients, so this is like um, how much of the variance can be explained by this, but they look at father's education and mother's education and then intelligence, like IQ, on whether the child um, planned on college, attended college, or graduated from college. Um, and they looked at it in males and females. And so I've circled sort of where it's really important. Um, and it turns out that the mother's education is extremely important, especially for their female children, of how far they will go. Um, in fact, this study showed that a mother's education level is more significant than socioeconomic status uh, for how successful their children will be. More data, a lot of this is on women, but in general, in, in parents' education, um, that your parents' education directly affects standardized test scores. Children learn by example, so if you're reading at home and attaining more education, your children do the same. Uh, more highly educated parents have higher expectations of their children, which then results in higher academic achievement, and the home environment really influences um, how p children behave in the school environment. Uh, they did this study on mothers, but I'm sure it's parents in general, but mothers who obtained education um, have positive learning experiences, they, they have these higher order thinking experiences, and these translate to their children. More highly educated mothers and parents are more verbally responsive to their children. They talk more to them, read more to them, and this obviously leads to better learning. And then better verbal interactions is linked to better cognitive development in your children. Mothers and parents who increase their education during the first three years of their children's lives, like they're in school during those years, actually have children with higher vocabulary and academic skill. Um, mothers who obtain further education during the first three years of their children's lives have children with higher math and reading scores. And then studies from a variety of countries show there's a positive relationship between especially a woman's schooling and the schooling of their children. Um, but men also, this is all very important uh, to be educated for your children. Uh, this is really awesome, especially this semester, because this is Malala, um, and her father gave a forum address just a couple weeks ago. And studies suggest that the educating girls is the closest thing to a silver bullet formula for accelerating human development. Um, I just want you to watch this little clip. It's amazing. The Pakistani teen shot in the head by the Taliban last October has returned to school for the first time since undergoing reconstructive surgery. Malala Yousafzai was targeted because she bravely defied a Taliban edict banning girls from getting an education. Details from the BBC's Sanjita Miska. Uh, because of the prayers of the people, now I can even walk, I can even run now. Malala Yousafzai's yeah, walk to school with her school dad school. has been quite a journey. She only narrowly escaped an assassination attempt in Pakistan. Following a remarkable recovery, this is her first day back at school here in Britain. So I dream for all the children that they should go to their school because it's their right, it's their basic right. And unlike most teens, it's her uniform that she's most proud of. It proves that I am a student. And it is the heaviest thing for me that, yes, I'm living my life, the old life. I'm going to school and I'm learning. 
Malala was a student in the Swat Valley when she began campaigning for girls' rights to an education. Incensed, Taliban extremists shot her in the head. Since then, she's been receiving treatment in Birmingham. At 15, Malala already has huge responsibilities. She's taken her fight for an education to the world stage, and there's even talk of a Nobel Peace Prize. But as she starts school here, her concerns are those of every other British teenager. It's all about making friends, fitting in, and simply doing her best. She herself wants to be a normal teenage girl and to have the support of other girls around her. I think talking to her, that's something that she's very much missed during her time in hospital. Malala will enter school in year nine. Sagita Maiska, BBC News, Birmingham. Isn't that amazing? And she did receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, so here's another motivation. I know it's, you know, kind of funny, but how about the money? <clears throat> Studies show unequivocally that going to college earns you more money. Okay, so these are just some cool stats um, through 2018. Um, okay, so here's my advice for you. Choose a major and stick with it. Turns out, unless you're seeking some specific license or certificate, your major actually doesn't matter all that much. Um, as long as it's in the right field or area. Like if you're planning on going on to med school or going on to graduate school, your particular major is less important. So really, if you want to get through um, <clears throat> and have a successful experience, just pick a major and stick with it. These are the majors that we have in our department, and I recommend all four of them. They're great. Um, unabashed bragging. So biology is the best. I'm biased, but it is the best. We get more people into graduate and professional school um, than most of the other majors in the college. Um, we also are heavily involved in mentored research experiences for students and lots of co-authorships. Now this 90% is actually pretty low for this particular year. We have been upwards of 40% of our students who will co-author a paper by the time they finish um, in biology. So we really are into the research. Um, we've also made it really flexible. So a few years ago, we tried to make it more flexible for like pre-med. Um, it wasn't as flexible before. So we've made some changes and you can go look at the map, but we've made some of the classes optional and we've made some of the electives available so that they will fulfill the pre-med requirements like the chemistry. Um, and so we've made it more flexible that way. So how are we different? So we offer the broadest coverage um, and the largest number of options. So we don't just do cellular molecular and genetics like some of the other major or other college or other departments in the college. We also do evolution ecology and biodiversity and we aren't just applied, but we're also theoretical. Um, so you get a really broad base and our faculty are the highest producing faculty in the college in terms of publication and research dollars. So again, there's lots of experience, uh, experiences available for you for mentored research. Our standards are very high, but we're here to help you. So. Let's go through the majors so you know what they are. So our biology is sort of our most general degree, um, most broad. This is the program purpose. You can find this on our website, but it's very flexible. It's good pre-med major, pre-professional school, um, great for graduate school as well. It is the broadest liberal arts education that we have in the life sciences. Employment opportunities. So graduate school, if you're a professor, there's salary. Natural resource science boss, you can go to professional school, medicine, dentistry, that salary is some immoral amount that you should give most away. Um, patent law, ditto. Wildlife, fishery, science, non-government organizations, biotech, forensics, science writing. Not great pay, but fun. Several other possibilities <clears throat> in the outdoors. Um, and then you can just be an educated parent and neighbor. Biodiversity and conservation is sort of a newer major in our in our department. So if you're really interested in conservation, this is the great major for you. Um, you take a lot of the ologies, so a lot of the um, uh, mammalogy, uh, herpetology, uh, all of those to, to get a broad base in, in animal physiology. Um, and so you're mostly concerned about stewardship Employment options are pretty much the same as a biology major. Like I said, the major is less important. Um, bioinformatics is a great one in our major. If you're really into computers, computer programming, but you love biology, this is the major for you. Um, this is where we're looking at big data sets, computer programming. You take a lot of computer science classes um, in bioinformatics. Um, 
So yeah, managing and analyzing and interpreting large biological data sets. The jobs are actually really in high demand right now. At the bachelor's level, you're actually making quite a bit more than most others at the bachelor's level. A master's level goes up, PhD level up even more, industry jobs astronomical. So um, it's a really great major if you're into computers. Biological science education. I'm a little biased to this one. Uh, this is if you want to be a science teacher at the junior high or high school level, or if you just want to back up in case medical school doesn't work out or whatever, um, this one will actually, you'll come out with a license to teach. Um, and it can still get doors open for you in, in professional schools, graduate schools, etc. cetera. Um, so sixth to 12th grade graders, it's the most important job in America. Why teach, right? This is one of the saviors. Um, calls to us is to teach of things both in heaven and the earth, under the earth, things which have been, which must shortly come to pass, uh, perplexities of the nation, judgments in the land, and knowledge of countries and kingdoms. So we have been called to teach. Um, I think each of us should seriously consider our sacred obligation to teach, even if we don't do a bioscience ed major. Uh, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to teach. And the fact that you've gotten your education in a gospel-centered way makes you even more valuable in teaching. Um, salary, not great, <laughs> but there are some perks, right? So here's kind of the salary. As your years of experience go up, um, it does go up. Public is better than private, but, but it is rather low. It's interesting. It's like the most important job in our society to teach the youth, and it pays like the least, which is unfortunate. Um, so we just love to say, you know, this, um, Oh, it's not going to play, but the, we have phenomenal cosmic power, but itty bitty living space. <laughs> That's kind of how teaching is. Uh, but the perks are you're on a nine month contract. So a lot of people do a different thing in the summer. Your same hours as your kids. So for women, especially, it's kind of great. You're in school when they're in school. You're out of school when they're out of school. Holidays, you always have them off. Um, unless you teach at BYU that doesn't seem to have the same holidays as the rest of school. Um, so. That's our majors, so how do you succeed? So this is my advice, and that is to get involved, and get involved soon. So this is actually me, I'm right here. I have tape, taping my glasses up. I was in Africa, it was hot, we were sweating. We were doing surgeries on, on the Beruli ulcer. <clears throat> this was just a humanitarian group that I joined while I was in college and got to go to Africa. It was amazing. Get research experience, so how do you do this? Number one, do not, these are the do nots. Do not call and leave a message. Don't call at all. I hardly ever answer my office phone. I'm just too busy for that. And also don't send a generic email. I get a lot of them that are, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm interested in doing research for my medical school application. They have no idea what I do, and they obviously haven't looked into it, and they've obviously sent this to a lot of professors. Don't do that. So what should you do? Demonstrate, a demonstrate, wow. demonstrate a genuine interest in what the professor does so you should look at their research, look it up, read some of their papers, know what you're getting into. Be willing to start at the bottom, cleaning glassware. There's no shame in it, right? It's a foot in the door. Start early, like right after you get a good grade in this class. Start getting in there. Um, expect it to be challenging and even frustrating because it's a new thing you're gonna get into that, that can be difficult. Um, how do you find the research? So if you go to the College of Life Sciences website and you choose a department, most of the departments have some kind of student resources tab and under that it should say mentored research. So if you go to the biology department, it will show you every faculty in the department. It will tell you what their research foci are, what requirements they have, prerequisites they have to work in the lab, um, and all of the like openings, all of that. It's really um, helpful. You can also click on the names and you can search up their work. You can actually go to their CV. CV is just our fancy curriculum vitae for a resume. But it has all the papers we've published and the things that we do. Um, so you can go look those up, read a couple papers, then email the professor by name. Hey, Dr. Jensen, I was reading your paper on overcoming evolution barriers in the undergraduate classroom. I find this research fascinating. I would love to meet with you and discuss further whether I can be a part of it. Here's 10 times that I'm available. Are you available any of those times? That is super helpful to me. Like when I get an email and a student says, I wanna meet with you, then I have to email back and say, okay, well, here's times that I'm available or when are you available? And it's like it's just an extra step. If they sent it to me in the first email and said, these are the 10 times and I could just pick one, it's awesome. Um, if after talking to the faculty member, you're still interested, you feel like they'd be a good mentor, because that's another big thing, right? You wanna make sure that you feel like they're gonna be a good mentor to you. 
um, then offer to do mentor research in their lab. There's credit, there's pay. If they say no, don't be discouraged. It's likely that they just have too many students already. Um, so you can stay in touch with them and hope for an opening, or you can just move on to the next professor. But don't let it discourage you. There's lots of opportunities for mentored research. Um, another bit of advice, give yourself options. So don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? Make sure that you are broad enough in your preparation that you have options. So not don't stress so much about the distant plans. Just make sure you have the ability to choose those distant plans, right? Um, and so I can tell you, like, my experience was like a wild goose chase. That's my little picture there. So when I started, I was like determined I was going to be a veterinarian. So I was an animal science major. I had my up to my shoulders in cow poop doing all kinds of um, dairy production actually was my major. Anyway, I wanted to be a vet, but about halfway through that experience, I realized no, this isn't exactly what I want to do. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll do pre-med. So luckily I had a major that would fit with that. I was taking the prerequisites for medical school. So I went ahead and took the MCAT, you know, did, did good. I'd been in Africa doing surgeries. I applied to med school and then I realized that I didn't really like patients either. I don't have patience for patients. Um, and so I thought, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do now? I'd finished a bachelor's degree. I applied to PA school thinking, well, maybe I'll be a physician assistant. I got into a bunch of those. I almost started at one. And then I just realized I really don't like patient care. I like more of the teaching. But luckily, I had a major that was pretty broad, even though I did a lot with cows. <laughs> it was pretty broad in the preparation, so it had options. So I went to graduate school. And you know what? I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I did a master's first. And that's just fine and a good way to go about it. And so you just kind of dabble. And that took me a couple years. And when I was in my master's program, I realized I started teaching adjunct at Utah Valley which was UVSC at the time. And I thought, oh my gosh, I found my calling. I love to teach. And then in my PhD, I decided to go on for a PhD. And I started, I did my master's in development, developmental biology, <coughs> looking at spinal cord development. So I started at Arizona State uh, looking at development as well. I was looking at heart development, same molecules involved. But I really was fascinated with the teaching. And I actually had, <coughs> excuse me, an advisor that was not very supportive of my life. I had a small baby. Um, I was putting in lots of hours, but kind of weird hours. And I was having to, you know, go to the bathroom and pump between classes. And he was just not super supportive, but I didn't let that stop me. Right. So I, I went and I just started talking to other people and saying, you know, how, how do I go about this? And, and they, and then I realized I could change advisors. I could find somebody else. And I did, I found a guy named Anton Lawson, amazing person. One of the first in this, um, science, science education field. Um, and he took me in and I switched labs. It was interesting when I told my professor I was leaving his lab, he yelled at me and told me he knew I wouldn't succeed because I was a woman, I was a mother, and I was a Mormon. <laughs> it was pretty bad. And I just said, see ya, watch me. And I went and I finished a PhD and I have this position here and I, you know, would love to just shove it in his face anyway <laughs> but I did succeed and so don't let things stop you but keep your options open do what you need to do so you have options available because it's not always going to work out the way that you planned I never planned on it working out the way that it did but it's been beautiful so my last little bit of advice the keys to finding success and happiness number one pick a job you love and if it takes you 10 majors and 10 attempts it's worth it Find something you love to do. I absolutely love my job. I love teaching biology. I love involving my children in the teaching. This up here is John Hawkes, who um, discovered Homo naledi. Uh, this is the Smithsonian work that I do. I love it, love it, love it. But it took me, you know, vet school, med school, PA school, graduate school. I was going to do spinal cord rehabilitation. Like, I was all over the map. But I finally like fell into what I love and, and it was worth the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years of college experience um, to do bachelor's, master's and PhD. It was worth it because now I have a job that I love and I love coming to work. So I encourage you to be patient and pick a job you love. Number two, take time to have fun right now. I hate to break it to you, but life just gets harder especially as you add children to it. I don't think I did this enough. I was so focused 
and I didn't didn't reach out and branch out enough and, and I look back and think man I should have kissed like 30 more boys than I did <laughs> anyway you should have fun because now is the time go backpack Europe go do an internship somewhere go join a humanitarian group and go to Africa like do all those things because life does get harder as you get more responsibilities and children and jobs and so take the time spend the money even if it gets you a little in debt not too much in debt but a little in debt do it because it, it now is the time to do that you guys are at the perfect age to do that um remember that there's more to life than school right so you will have opportunities whether it's family or not there will be other opportunities for you outside of your academic pursuits that are going to take up time and that are going to be wonderful so mine happened to be you know i fell in love with this great man unexpectedly at a time when I was like no I'm going to medical school leave me alone men and it was perfect and I have had kids all through graduate school and they were difficult and but so worth it and I realized that there's so much more to life than just school and sometimes I lose sight of that even now sometimes I network too many hours and I need to remind myself that there are other things that are just as work that are more important than school girls don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Okay, so this is a picture of me um, up here when I got my PhD. I had three kids. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I was supposed to be done, and I had just gotten pregnant with Gage right here, and I was just finishing up, and one morning I had a catastrophic computer failure, and I lost everything. I lost my whole dissertation. I lost all my data. Oh my gosh. It was awful, and, and it was back in the days where we just didn't have these automatic backups, like the cloud, and I, I didn't have anything. I had to email committee members and ask them to send me whatever they had. I had to, luckily, all my data was handwritten stuff, so I just had to re-digitize it and analyze it. It put me back eight months so that when I graduated, he was four months old. It's interesting if you ask this little one here, Cash, what does mommy do? <laughs> he would, for months, he would go, because evidently I sat and cried a lot. Um... But anyway, I had a supportive husband who said, you know, this isn't going to stop you and you can do this. And, and I did. I went to Africa. This is me in Africa. I'm now teaching here. It's been hard. I'm not going to lie. It is hard to do. Let me tell you, there's never a good time to have kids. So you just have to do it. I had three during my PhD, or one, one at the end of my master, one during my master's, two during my PhD, and then one in my first year here at BYU. Um, and it just and and was kind of a oops wow yay pregnant again and and I couldn't imagine life without my little Emmett so um, you can do it you can do it all you can you just have to be willing to sacrifice here and there and and willing to settle for it's not going to be perfect I am not a perfect mom I am not a perfect professor. I can't be perfect at everything because there's just too many things on my plate and that's okay. I'm willing to take the best parts of all of it and just make it work. So if you ever want to come talk to me girls about how to do it or boys about how to be supportive of your girl that wants to do all this, come talk to me. My door's always open. Um, lastly, keep your priorities straight, right? So moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true, for the Lord God has spoken it. And I firmly believe that. If you keep the Lord first in whatever you do, the blessings will come, whether it's family, whether it's a career, whether it's both. They'll come if you keep your priorities straight. And sometimes that was hard for me too. Things seemed so busy and confusing and things never went the way I had planned. Um, but they all worked out and they're still working out and things have been hard even since then. But I've always had the Lord feel like I've always put the Lord first and he's really uh, helped me through all of this. So that's my, my parting advice. Um, I hope that you will rely on the Lord in, in all that you do. And I hope that you feel comfortable coming and talking to me. If you have any problems with anything, really, I'm just kind of your mom here on campus. Oh my gosh, that makes me old. But anyway, you can come and talk to me um, about whatever I can give you advice on, on at least what I've been through. Um, and I hope that you will have great success in what you do. And I hope that you find that happiness that you're looking for. You find that job that you love. 
that school is a wonderful experience for you, that BYU is a wonderful experience for you, and that you don't take it for granted, that you are here at this university, and that you can do great things with what you've been given. And so I leave that with you with my testimony that the Lord is very real, and he cares about you, and he loves you, and he will help you. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.